So yesterday, Derek from Veritasium uploaded a physics quiz showing five interesting physics-related rela phenomena and asking how do they work. So I think I'm, instead of just writing a comment on the video, I'm going to try to answer the, each question in video form. Number one, have a friend hold a cane out horizontally for you or another similar object. And putting your two index fingers together, try to place them underneath the center of mass. When they let go, you will find it doesn't normally work. But now try putting each index finger at opposite ends of the cane and then moving your index fingers in towards the middle. What you will find is that they always end up right under the center of mass of the cane. How does this work? I think this one has to do with friction. For instance, I can take this piece of wood, and of course I can try to do the, the control test. It doesn't work. Let me do this. And it works nicely. I believe what's happening is it has to do with the differential friction, or whatever the term would be for it. Like, for instance, I start out like here. This, uh, the left arm is moving, and the right arm is moving. But it gets to a point now where there's more weight on this hand, because this is further in, so it's actually more of a, as a pivot. So the amount of wood on the outside is pushing more on, on this hand. So then whenever I pull this hand in, it has less, less friction, so it moves. Well, then it gets to a point where it has more friction than the other hand, because there's more wood over. There's more weight on this side than there is on this side. So this this hand goes in, and this hand, then this hand, then this hand, this hand, until it goes to the middle. So it's it's really a balancing act between which side has the most weight on it. So. If one goes too far, too far ahead, it gets too much friction and it stops unless the other one catch up, and then this one gets too much weight on it and stops and let, lets this one do it. It might, might also have an effect of just slowing down one side, not necessarily stopping it. This wood's kind of rough, so it, it's really easy just to stop or go. But yeah, I think it has to do with the friction difference due to the when it gets out of balance it corrects itself by putting friction in the right place. Next question. Number two, the phone flip. Have you ever tried to spin your phone? If you do it in this direction, it's pretty easy. It stays nicely aligned. If you spin it along its short axis, you'll also find it spins very well. But if you try to flip your phone end over end like this, you can't do it cleanly. The phone will never flip simply end over end without also rotating in one of the other directions. Even when I make an almost perfect flip, instabilities grow until the phone rotates around another axis. Why can't... No, I still can't do it. Why is it so? I don't know about you, but I've never had any issues with flipping my phone. Joking aside, I have my stepsister's broken phone, and we'll test it with this. So first up, we have the vertical throw, like this. Now we try on the side, like this. So now we do the actual experiment of trying to flip it this way. Whoops.
Now this is taking probably about 25 minutes of pondering to figure out. I'm thinking that it has to do with the moment of inertia. Basically, if you spin it like this, it's a very stable rotation. If you spin it like this, it's a little bit less stable, but still pretty stable rotation. Whenever you try to spin it like this, the moment of inertia makes it very unstable. So, any like little mess up, because it's almost impossible to throw it perfectly. So any amount of energy transferring it in that direction or that direction will then make it transfer more of its rotation in this axis to rotation in this axis. So I imagine if maybe you were to drop it off of a big building or drop it, throw, it, throw it into a vacuum of outer space, it might go from turning like this, a very unstable rotation, to turning like this, to then just turning like that. I'm not sure though. I don't fully understand moment of inertia, but I think it has to do with that this has a very big moment of inertia in this direction, but a very small moment of inertia in this direction. Well, I'm probably, probably wrong, but let's go on to the third question. Number three. You've probably seen that if you rub a cup on your hair, you can make it electrically charged, and if you bring it close to a stream of water, you can actually cause that stream to deflect. Now, usually this is used in chemistry textbooks as a demonstration of the polar nature of water. Water is a molecule with a more positive side and a more negative side. And so what happens, so you're told, is that the water molecule flips around so the positive side of the water faces the negative side of the cup, and that is what attracts the water to the cup. But this is not the real explanation. If you have a uniform electric field, there's an equal force pulling the positive side towards it as there is pushing the negative side away from it. And so you can't actually do more than just turn the molecules. You would need a really, really strong gradient in your electric field to make this work at all. And it, it basically is just not gonna happen from a cup. So why is the stream actually attracted to a charged cup? That is the question. So for this next experiment, we're going to be using a comb as a source of st static electricity. And we'll be trying to bend a flow of water. First off, let's turn on the water. That looks pretty good to me. Now, as you can see, the comb is not charged. So now I run the comb through my hair to produce some static electricity. Well, that definitely does work. I'm quite pleased with that. I'm thinking, okay, so ox the oxygen atoms inside of water is diamagnetic, but this isn't ma a magnet. Well, at least I don't think. So I, I have to say maybe, I mean, because this isn't just H2O that we're dealing with. There's also stuff dissolved into it, like minerals and fluorine and chlorine and stuff like that. So I'm thinking maybe it's the stuff that's dissolved into the water is being attracted to this. So the static, static electricity. I'm not so sure though. Next question. Number four. Take a piece of your favorite cereal and drop it into a bowl of water. Then using a very strong magnet, try to pull the cereal around. Isn't that cool? So why is cereal magnetic? To test this phenomena, we have a stack of high strength neodymium magnets to make one big nice magnet. And we have several of these breakfast cereals. Now these ones are multi meal honey graham toasters. Put one in. So I believe this phenomena is caused by the relatively high amount of iron inside of this breakfast cereal.
And this hunch is backed up by the nutrition facts on the back of the container. As you can see, it says iron as one serving as 50% of your daily needs of iron, which that's a lot. And finally, five, the tea bag rocket. Take a tea bag and cut off the sealed end very carefully. Now, dump out the tea. Form the tea bag into a square column and balance it on the plate. Now, light the top of the tea bag on fire. Try to light it evenly on all sides. Get ready for takeoff in three, two, one. Ha, yeah! That is the beauty of the tea bag rocket. So why did that happen? I think why that's happening is the flame is making the air rise and the tube is making it form like a vortex. Well, after the paper burns away, the vortex is still has a little bit of momentum in it and the paper is now an ash, so it's extremely light and it gets sucked up in the vortex while the vortex is dying out. At least that's my theory, but oh well. That's pretty much all the questions. Hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. See ya!